Thank you so much. Good to be with all of you this morning. Appreciate the, uh, the good words, and I agree with everything Brother Hugh had to say. Uh, if you will, turn your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to try to pick up where we left off last night, follow that same uh, subject line. Why do bad things happen to good people? <clears throat> and like I said last night, some of you aren't here been corrected on that lots of times. I see some more ministry in the congregation, and so I'll just uh, I'll say it again. There are actually good people. Uh, <laughs> uh, Psalms 14 said, there's, no good, there's none good, no, not one. But then you read about a man by the name of Joseph of Arimathea, and the Bible says he was a good man. And the Bible also says that Barnabas, in Acts chapter 11, was a good man. Man, So at least we have two good people that the Bible says there's actually two good people. And I think we could say that Jesus was a good person. A lot of bad things happened to him. And uh, so there are good people. So what does that mean? How do you reconcile Acts 11, I believe it's uh, Luke 23 and Psalm 14? Well, prior to you being born again, that's true. There is none good, no, not one. But after somebody is born again... They have the Spirit of God in them. And we just reminded you last night that Galatians chapter 5 says that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness. It's a fruit of the Spirit. So if you're born again and you have the Spirit of God, you can do what Brother Hugh said. You can, uh, or what the Bible says that Brother Hugh was talking about, was to provoke one another to love and good works. You can do good works. You can be a good person. So actually, the sermon is titled correctly. Why do bad things happen to good people? There are some good people, and you and I both know them. Uh, it may not be you yourself. You might not consider yourself a good person, but you know Looking at somebody, the fruit that they bear in their life, you just think to yourself, why on earth did this bad thing happen to such a good person? They seem to be so harmless. They seem to be in so in love with the Savior, and yet they seem to suffer so much tragedy and so many bad things in their life. There are three very simple answers in the gospel that are going to answer, uh, you know, try to answer the question with. The first answer last night was chastisement. You know, good people sometimes behave badly, and good children of God sometimes go off the deep end. They have bad experiences, make bad choices, and God chastises them uh, because He loves them. And uh, the Bible says that no chastisement for the present time seemeth to be joyous, but is grievous. But afterwards it yields the peaceable fruits of righteousness to them that are exercised thereby. And we've all been exercised by the you know, it is a workout when you're being chastised by God, isn't it? It's, it uh, takes its time consuming. It exercises your spiritual muscles. It is certainly, uh, it'll, he'll work you out. Uh, whatever problem you've got, it'll, it'll, you know, he'll work it out of you. Um, and that's, that's an easy one, right? And that's the obvious one. That is the obvious answer to the question of why bad things are happening to such a good person. Oh, they must be misbehaving themselves. After all, isn't this what Job's counselors, Job's friends, his so-called friends? And by the way, a lot of people get on to Job's friends and say they were bad friends. I'd like to say that Job's friends were actually very good friends. Do you consider what they did? When they heard that Job had lost his children, when they had heard that Job had lost all of his wealth, they had heard that Job had lost his health, uh, they went to him. They dropped what they were doing, and they went and stayed with Job until he got better. I mean, that is, uh, that's a real friend right there. I don't know of, uh, there, there's not a whole lot of friends that would do that. It's certainly when a lot of your friends, and you'll find this out, when a lot of your friends figure out you don't have any more money, <laughs> they don't, they're not really that friendly to you anymore. When the party's over and uh, everything stops happening the way it used to happen around you, then you'll find out who your real friends are. And I would say that Job had, Job had more good friends than a lot of us have. He had at least four good friends that dropped what they were doing and came and saw about him. Now, they might have been misguided. They might not have said the right things. But what did they say? They continued to try to pin it on him. They kept trying to say, Job... You've obviously done something wrong. This is a punishment of God. 
And so that's the obvious one. I'm using Job to illustrate the point. And we all know that Job hadn't done anything wrong. Uh, Job was just minding his own business, praying for his children. He knew his children was misbehaving. And so every day he went and prayed for them, whether he knew what they were doing or not. He just knew they were probably in need of prayer. He was a good daddy. He was a good provider. He was a good husband. He was, it was a lot of good things. He was a good person. A lot of bad things happened to Job. And we know why. It wasn't chastisement. But last night, going back to chastisement, what did, he, what did he tell us was the good part about chastisement other than uh, the end of it when the peaceable fruits of righteousness are worked out in our lives? What is the, the other great part about chastisement? The, under, the other wonderful thing about being chastised of the Lord means that you are a child of God. It is one of the great defining evidences in a child of God's life that they are a child of God. And he reminds us of that in the book of uh, Hebrews, that if you truly are being chastised by God Almighty, well, then it's a great evidence that you're a child of God. For he correcteth and he chastiseth and he scourgeth every son whom he receiveth, and he dealeth with you as sons and not as uh, with illegitimate children. You see, you are a child of God if God has ever chastised you, and it should be a sweet evidence to you, at least some consolation while you're going through being beaten by the Heavenly Father, uh, that you are actually going to heaven when you die. So just keep that in the back of your mind uh, as a set of context for the next answer to the question, why do bad things happen to good people? In 1 Peter chapter 1, he says this, and I want you to notice the progression of his words. He says, Peter, an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, and to the saints scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, unto sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he says, to the strangers scattered throughout. Do you know why there were strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, all over Turkey and the eastern Mediterranean? Do you know why that was going on back then? Because the Romans had persecuted the Christians to such a degree that it was no longer safe for them to stay in the place that they had originated uh, their Christianity and their Christian walk. You had a couple of choices. You could stay and die. You could deny Christ and live, or you could run away and hide. And these people are the ones that said, well, we're not going to deny the Lord Jesus Christ. and We don't really feel like dying today. So we're going to be scattered through the four corners of the earth. And he's saying to those people, you and I are not living that way, my friends. And I hear a lot of people saying, well, we might be living that way one day. But you're not living that way right now, though. Okay? So let's get real with it. You're not persecuted. Nobody's being thrown in jail. Nobody's being killed in America for preaching what I'm preaching. Yet, thank God, and I hope it never happens, but for 230 years, by and large, and I know there's some amateur historian out there that's going to give me some case where an American's... Anyway, look, by and large, the church has survived in peace in America. Preaching the message that this brother is preaching and that I'm preaching, brother Sam's preaching, and brother Derek's preaching, and all the other ministry that's here preaches. We've survived in peace. Nobody's scattered. But these people were scattered because they had a choice to make. You either die or you give up everything you've ever worked for and ever earned. And you go live in hiding. And when you worship, you worship before the sun comes up because you don't want anybody knowing what you're doing. You go into the graveyards because the Romans were superstitious and they thought evil spirits were in the graveyard. So you go worship in the graveyard where it's safe and they won't come chase you. We don't live like that. To the strangers scattered throughout those places. And then he reminds them, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. God loved you before the foundation of the world. There's a lot of people that say, ah, you see, Brother John, that's foreknowledge there. God knew beforehand who would choose him. I'm telling you, that word means loved beforehand. That's all it means. 
for knowledge. The word knowledge in the Bible sometimes is synonymous with love. And in this case, it is synonymous with love. And God loved his children before the world ever began. And he reminds them of that. He says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father. Through sanctification of the Spirit, we're born again by the Spirit of God, set aside by God's Holy Spirit, when and where He chooses, unto the sprinkling of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I had a, a preacher one time debate with me and say, yeah, that's our obedience. That doesn't make any sense. He's talked about the work of the Father. He's talked about the work of the Spirit. And now he's talking about the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ in conjunction with the obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ humbled himself, Bible says in uh, Philippians chapter 2. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. That's Jesus' obedience, not mine and yours. That doesn't make any contextual sense there to put our obedience in there. You see that? So now we've got the work of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Securing our eternal salvation. The Father elected us. The Spirit borns us again based on the work of the Son who died for us at Calvary's cross. And an allusion to the Old Testament where the high priest would sprinkle the blood on the altar. Thus satisfying the requirement that God had put down to Moses many, many years ago. He is saying, he is saying in that allusion, the sprinkling of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, that our high priest has satisfied the requirement of the Heavenly Father. So then he says, Grace unto you and peace be multiplied from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who has begotten us again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. You know, I love to go eat at a restaurant with my wife, and uh, I was taught that by my father. When you go, go big. Spend all the money you got. <laughs> <laughs> don't come home with any money. He said, you, <laughs> you can always get more money. You can't ever get any more time. So he's, you're going to spend the time. Go ahead and spend the money. And uh, so we do. And I'm not ashamed of it. I love my wife. I want to make her feel special. And you know what I do to make her even feel more special? When we're really going on a real date, not a McDonald's, Wendy's date, but a real date. Where we got a babysitter. Everything's taken care of. I like to call ahead to the restaurant and make a reservation. I love to see the, the faces on the people when I, when I just kind of waltz into the restaurant. Reservation for my Zell, please, and just go ahead and sit down. Wonderful. Your you know, I can make that reservation incorrectly, can I? I've actually had that happen before, where I call, make a reservation, get to the restaurant. They don't have the reservation. Uh, I don't know, what, what do you mean you don't have the reservation? I made this reservation a week ago. Well, your name's not on the book. I guess you can get a line. It'll be an hour and a half. What? Well, see, what happened was there were people there. There's a busy night. There was people more important than I was. We don't know Mizell, but we know this guy. This guy's a regular customer. We're going to give this guy Mizell's table, and when Mizell gets here, we'll just tell him whoever this Mizell character is, we don't have his reservation. That's not going to happen in heaven. Jesus Christ made the reservation for you. And when you get there, it's going to be waiting on you. Your seat at the table is not going to be taken by anybody that's more important than you, anybody that's older than you, anybody that knows the Heavenly Father better than you do. It's reserved in heaven for you. It's incorruptible, it's undefiled, faith is not away, reserved in heaven for you. Who are kept? Now listen. Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. Oh, wait a minute, Brother John. He's been talking about eternal things, and now he's talking about faith. And if you stopped there, you'd be immensely confused. But read on. <clears throat> Wherefore, I'm sorry, in whom you greatly rejoice. Wherefore, if need be, though now for a time, you are in heaviness through manifold temptation. That the trial of your faith, 
being much more precious than of gold, which perisheth, though it be tried by fire, might be found unto the praise and the honor and the glory of Jesus Christ at his appearing. The reason why bad things happen to good people, these were good people. These were the people that refused, refused to bow their knee to Caesar. These were the people that refused to give up their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And because of it, had lost everything. Their houses, their lands. A lot of them had lost their family members, would not speak to them anymore. These were good people and something bad had happened to them. They had been scattered. And the Apostle Paul is reminding them. Though now, I want to remind you, you are a child of God. And here's how you were made a child of God. You were elected by God the Father. You were bought and paid for by God the Son. You are sanctified by God the Holy Spirit. And not only all of that, not only are you just a child, but there's something coming to you when you die. There is an inheritance coming to you. It's incorruptible, undefiled. It fadeth not away. It's reserved in heaven for you. He's reminding you that you're a child of God and exactly what that means. And then he says... If need be, right now you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. You ever been heavy? Has the weight of life ever been heavy upon you? Has temptation been so crushingly heavy that you didn't feel like you could stand up under the weight of it? Perhaps it wasn't temptation. Perhaps it was, as he says here, it was a trial of your faith. It wasn't a temptation to evil, but it was just the crushing blows kept coming one after another. And it was just a trial to see if you were going to be see if you were going to be steadfast in your faith and keep the faith as these Christians did. I tell you something, we're living in strange, weird times, aren't we? The Bible, uh, the Bible tells us that they were living in an untoward generation. The Bible tells those folks that they were to save themselves from an untoward generation. The word untoward means crooked. And if there is, if there is a right def description in the Bible for this generation, I'd say it's an untoward generation. This is a weird, crooked time we're living in. It is fraught with temptation, especially with young people. Moral temptation, philosophical temptation, mental temptation, all kinds of temptation. But not only that, sometimes the Lord will allow you to go through a trial of faith. He allowed Job to go through it. Now, he didn't put Job through it, but he allowed Job to go through it, didn't he? And then if we read about a character by the name of Abraham, we know that Abraham actually was put through a trial of faith by God himself. So why do bad things happen sometimes? It's a trial of faith. And you, you do well to pass it. You do well to pass it. Abraham passed his trial. Job passed his trial, his test. And what happened? They were kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. What, what was kept? Not their eternal salvation, but the assurance of their eternal salvation was kept through their faith in God. Job's wife said, why don't you just curse God and die? And he, and, she, and he told her, you speak like a foolish woman. We're not going to curse God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He giveth and he taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Who was it in the first place that gave us our children, honey? Who was it that gave us all of our money? And who is it that gives us our health? And who is it that we live and move and have our being? Get a little perspective. You're just, you're just viewing it. I'm the one going through it. And you need to get your mind right, darling. We're not going to curse the God that loves us. We just got to get through this a little while. What an attitude. Abraham went home and told his wife. I don't even know if he went home and told her. But honey, the one that God promised, I'm about to go kill him because God said so. Man, and he passed it, didn't he? When he got up there, what, did, what happened? The Lord fulfilled what he told his son. The Lord will provide himself a sacrifice. And he has for all of us. All right. So chastisement. What do I have? Three minutes left. <laughs> so chastisement. It's one reason why bad things happen to good people. But in the midst of it, you should know that because you're being chastised, it means you're a child of God. The trial of faith is another reason why bad things happen to good people. God's testing you out. 
See if you'll pass. I hate being tested by God, don't you? <laughs> I hate it. And uh, the, I, I think the quickest way to get tested by God is to test Him out. To tempt God. You know, I've been told, I, liked, I like adventures. My mom finally figured it out. She's with us in the congregation this morning. She sent me a birthday card when I was 35 years old. said, to an adventurous spirit with all of our love. <laughs> said, that's it, you finally got it. I love going on adventures. I, lo- I know I sound like a character out of uh, The Hobbit or something, but I love going on an adventure. Uh, and, and in those adventures, sometimes it gets a little dangerous. And I don't know. I like the danger. You know, it's, it's really, you're really living when you're really living uh, one step close to death. It's terrible, isn't it? <laughs> and uh, I've often been told, you know, you ought not tempt God. <laughs> you're tempting God by doing that. I say, I'm only tempting God if I say to you that God's going to save me from this foolishness. I never do say that. <laughs> I hope he will, but I'm not going to put that on the Lord. Now, if I go, you know, if I go jumping out of a plane without a parachute and say, well, God's going to bear me up on it, you know, angel's wings. Yeah, that's tempting God, and it's not going to work out for you. So don't tempt God. He'll tempt you, you know, I'm saying he'll tempt you in the sense that he tempted Abraham. He'll put you through a trial of your own faith, and uh, he'll win, by the way. You'll just don't get in a tug of war with God. So chastisement is one way that good people go through bad things. A trial of faith is another way that good people go through bad things. And then I want to look at the real answer to this question. It's found in Romans chapter 8. Very simple. For we know that the whole of creation groaneth and travaileth together in pain until now. And not only they, but we ourselves, which have the first fruits of the Spirit grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, even the redemption of our bodies. When is the redemption of your body and mine going to happen? It's the last day, isn't it? When your body will actually be redeemed from the earth. That's what he's talking about there. He's talking about, we are looking forward to the last day. And until the last day of earth occurs, until the last second of this earth's existence, there is an immutable principle at play that will not be overturned until the Lord comes back and consumes this place with flaming fire. And that immutable principle that is in play is the law of sin and death. And what he is talking about there, when he says, We know that the whole of creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. He's talking about describing childbirth. And if anybody's ever been a witness to that ordeal, you know that I've correctly termed it. It is an ordeal. And it is painful. And it's horrifying. And it's just, it's, a, it's an otherworldly experience. And what he is saying is that this earth is coming apart at the seams. And every volcano that happens that kills thousands of people and all of the tornadoes that happen in the Midwest and the hurricanes and the earthquakes that go out in the West and every time a little child gets run over by a car and every time lightning strikes some forest that doesn't need lightning to strike and thousands of acres of forest and property are destroyed means that you cannot blame it on God's direct intervention in this world. You cannot blame God with the volcanoes and the earthquakes. It is just simply a product of living in a sin-cursed earth. There are accidents. There are bad things that happen all of the time. And I've got news for you. God doesn't have anything to do with it. And I give you one example to disprove that. If you're thinking to yourself, well, God can't be in control and not have everything to do with everything. God can't be God. I've heard that. God can't really be God if he doesn't have anything, something to do with everything. I want you to listen very carefully. He says it twice. Jeremiah, I think, 19 and Jeremiah 35. I want you to listen to what the children of Israel were doing. The children of Israel were told, When they possess Canaan's land, you drive out all the strangers in the land. Because, and he told them why. 
Because they will pollute you with their idolatry. They will bring, they will influence you. And I, and I am the Lord thy God which redeemed you from the house of the bondman. And thou shalt have no other gods before me. Neither shalt thou make unto thee any graven images. Exodus chapter 20. The Ten Commandments. That's what he told Moses when they were entering into Canaan's land. When they were about to the first time. And so what do they do? They go, into the, they, they go into Canaan's land and they did not push out all the strangers. Four or five hundred years later, here we are, the prophet Jeremiah, writing on the Holy Spirit, is simply just writing the consequences of their, of their disobedience and they're not listening to the Lord. And he says, you caused your sons, you built, you built altars in the high places unto Baal, and you caused your sons and your daughters to pass through the fire unto Molech. If you don't know what that is, I'm going to describe it for you, and I'm going to try to do it gently. But it is one of the most horrible things that's ever been, uh, it's ever been promulgated on this earth. In the worship of Baal, a subset of Baal was the worship of Molech. And Molech required that people give their newborn babies in a sacrifice of fire. They would, the priest of Molech would push a newborn child down the burning, brazen, brass arms into the flaming belly of an altar by the name of Baal. It made me shudder to think that they had found one of the altars of Molech and they brought it to New York to display as an art display this year. I thought to myself, man, why on earth? But that's what, listen now, that's not what the Gentiles were doing. That's what the children of Israel were doing. God's chosen race. God's chosen people. And he specifically forbade them from doing it, didn't he? I just quoted it to you in Exodus chapter 20. This is an idol God. Not only do they have the idol God, but they're worshiping the idol God. He said, you caused, you did it. You caused your sons and your daughters to pass through the fire unto Molech, which neither I spake Neither did I command, neither did it enter into my mind at any time. Now you tell me how God had something to do with the murder of those innocent children. He says it very plainly. I didn't have anything to do with it. As a matter of fact, I told you not to do it. Now why didn't God stop that? If God's all-powerful and God's good God then why didn't God stop that evil? Why didn't God stop that iniquity? I don't know. I think that's the burning question on everybody's mind. Why doesn't God stop iniquity and evil? I don't know. And when you get to heaven, you'll know, because we'll know as we're known, which means we'll have complete knowledge. We'll know all the questions, we'll have the answers to the questions that we need to. I've I heard a lot of people say, well, when I get to God, I'm just I'm gonna ask him that question. No instantaneously you'll know everything you need to know you won't have any questions when you get there but listen I'm just trying to drive home the point to you God does have a plan God does have a plan but the plan does not involve murder and the plan does not involve sin the plan involves victory in Jesus over murder and over sin and over tragedy and after you've suffered a while, by the way, this is Peter speaking, talking about the same thing that we're talking about right now, human suffering and why it happens. He said, after you've suffered a while, the Lord establish you, strengthen you, and make you perfect. You know when that's going to happen? In heaven. I'm telling you, we live in a sin-cursed earth, and bad things do happen to good people all the time. God doesn't have anything to do with it, but God does have something to do with you getting to heaven. He's got everything to do with you getting to heaven. And he's banished tragedy and darkness and sin from that immortal place to which all of his children are going. God bless you is my prayer. Thank you for your attention.